You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome. You have tuned into The Mountain Gardener Hour. We spent been doing this for lots of years, creating garden content, garden advice, garden Uh, inspiration for the mountains of Arizona. And it is unique. Most of our garden information comes out of Phoenix because that's where all the broadcasts are coming from or out of Tucson because that's where our U of A extension, that's our extension college, Tucson. A lot of agriculture is down there. Um, But for, for backyard homeowners, there's really nothing for us. And so it became frustrating years ago. I went, this is ridiculous. We've got to have a better resource for garden you know, insight here in the high elevations of the cooler, drier portions of, of Arizona. And so I started writing a garden column. I started, uh, and that was the, the outline for the actual radio show. I used to take call-ins and just it's just changed over the years. Now we're into podcasts and newsletters, all kinds of crazy stuff. It just gets more and more just funner all the time as uh, th- this uh, internet social media stuff becomes where the small guys, the little gar- little backyard gardeners, uh, small business owners, we're doing things now that the big guys, the box stores, the predators that come in and, and take over, destroy your community, they dream they could do this. They wish uh, but they're just after turns and, and cranking things through, not not that connection with the community. So we host garden classes and radio shows, and so that's the format for this. So the the mindset, the the idea of this show is uh, we're just friends, we're neighbors talking across the fence, and just here's some advice that works in, in my backyard, and then it will probably apply to yours. And so the insects that hit uh, a neighborhood. They don't hit one yard. They they hit the entire yard. When things go into bloom, they don't go into bloom just in your yard. They bloom over that entire portion of the community. So we just take a picture of that or describe it or tell you how to plant it. And that's the format. This week, there's a lot going on now. We've been fertilizing like crazy. So it's time. March is the time to fertilize. And I'm getting some questions, some feedback. And I thought I'd explained it well enough, but I need to highlight Maybe try to simplify why and what you use and, and how often you use it. So I thought I would start the show with that because it's so timely. It's so appropriate now to fertilize everything in the landscape. You know, well, I've been from the Midwest. We never fertilize. It was always good. That you aren't, you're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. This this is this is different. The mountains of Arizona are, are wind swept and then water swept. You wouldn't think that, but the way our monsoonal rains come, the bit of topsoil and organic matter that was there will get these heavy events events in July, August, and September. We get most of our rain then that just lifts and carries downstream uh, most of the beneficial leaves and and, and needles that form in, in your landscape. And so they get carried down, so you get these beautiful uh, river bottoms or, or dry wash bottoms that have gorgeous soil, but your your lot with the with the vista that gets that you look out with you don't have hardly any soil, so there's no organic matter showing up in your in your yard. Plus, if there was, we took the backhoe and scraped that all off to make room for your pad, your driveways, your your patios, and so really some of you have no nutritional value whatsoever. You put a plant out there in the yard and in two years it turns bright yellow. We call this chlorosis. And so it's lack of sunlight and lack of food. Combine that and you get this was a beautiful blue junipers or blue or or red photinias. And now all of a sudden they're yellow. They're off color. You're going, it just doesn't quite seem the same. Or why does my neighbors look so good in mine? It just doesn't have that robust look. Why? It all comes down to food. That's the main thing. So what you'll find is in the mountains of Arizona, you're having to fertilize more regularly than, let's say, other areas where you've got more humidity. It's less elevation. So you've got, we've got more sun. It just fades things out. We have less nutrients. So you need to replenish that more regularly. 
And I say you need to fertilize three times a year. And if you're thinking of holidays, you're thinking Easter, Independence Day, or the 4th of July, and Halloween. Halloween's actually the most important feeding of the entire year. And you're using not a water-soluble food. If you don't have any food in your soil already, you need to give it more stabilized fertilizers. That would be slow-release, and I say organic, granular fertilizers. Stay away from the water-soluble things, things you mix up, you know, two scoops in a gallon of water. The reason is you're using that water-soluble, but most of your plants in the yard, it's it's flushed out of the soil faster than the plant could take it up. It needs to stay around longer so the plant the plants just can't absorb that much fertilizer that quickly. If you're coming from areas that have a lot of topsoil and nutrients already showing up in your soil, well, then it's different. There you're just supplementing what's already there. It's like a, a Snickers bar for your, for your landscape. When it really needs steak and potatoes, we need something hearty. Oh, we're going to build some muscles. We're going to grow this season. There you need a granular food. And I would suggest in the mountains of Arizona, you want to stay away from chemical foods. You don't want a petroleum-based chemical, which is what most of your name brands are, because that it releases faster, at least slower than a water-soluble. So you put Scott's, Scott's uh, Turf Builder or Ortho or... Peters or some, some of these big names you'll find at the big stores, they're chemically based. They're released in about three weeks, maybe four. If they're a little more expensive, they, they encapsulate that food in, in some silicone. And so now maybe it releases over a month, month and a half. But still, it's faster than much of the food is released, faster than the plant can pick it up. That's why I'm a strong believer in organics. It, it feeds the soil, not just the, 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 the plant. It feeds the soil too, so you get this symbiotic thing. So now it attracts worms and mycorrhizal fungi and beneficials into the soil. So the plant goes, I want a root. Now with that being said, I have to do one other caveat. In the spring for my own, my own garden, now remember the format. My, my name is Ken. We're just neighbors, we're friends talking across the fence, and this is what I'm doing in my own gardens, and, and it works. And here's why. I put the waters, all-purpose plant food, it's a food I made years and years ago out in the yard. It's a 744 organic, main ingredients, cottonseed meal. But at the same time, while I'm spreading that over me, the entire lawn, everything, lawn, flowers, trees, shrubs, roses, everything gets that one food. It's good enough. Slow release, consistent over three month period. It really does a number. At the same time, while I'm spreading that, I also spread soil sulfur. Sulfur is a, it changes the chemistry of the soil. So it lowers the pH of your, of your soil. So, so you folks that have had pools and hot tubs, that you're checking your pH all the time of your water. You also need to check the pH of your soil. Now I can tell you, I've seen enough soil tests that I know that your garden is going to be very high or very alkaline type of pH. And so we're always trying to bring that pH down. We're always trying to make that soil acidic. The reason being, I know that the water we're all using in northern Arizona is going to be alkaline. We're mainly dealing with well waters. So well water is going to be very alkaline because the water where it's coming th through the soil you're pumping that out. Now you're using that. Even, even your cities are pumping it out of the ground and sending it to your house. Those are going to be very alkaline. Now, if you're on the Salt River Project, you're coming off of, of rivers. Let's say you're next against uh, uh, Camp Verde Cottonwood and you're on the Verde River. Okay, that might be different, but how many really are tuned in that are pumping directly from the river? It's just they don't have, that's so few, very few ag very few have permits to do that, but there's a few. There, your water might not be as alkaline. Probably is, but probably not. The rest of us, which is all basically all of us, are very alkaline. I put the food down to fertilize the plant. I put the soil sulfur down at the same time to change the pH so it lowers it so the soil isn't as alkaline so the plant can actually absorb more iron and zinc and magnesium and, and all of the beneficial micronutrients that also show up. That way you get better flowers, 
more fragrance out of your lilacs, better color out of your roses. Just everything works in unison. And I do both of those at the same time. And I'm done until the July fertilizing, when I'll just use the all-purpose food, and the Halloween fertilizing, which I just use the food. And that's how I fertilize in my own gardens. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. Hi, Waters here with this week's Plant of the Week and our show-off for Scythias. A new standout for Scythia with very large, very bright solar yellow flowers that adorn the plant from head to toe. Relax! This showy spring shrub is beautiful and requires no pruning or cleanup. This show-off is just days away from bloom and limited, so don't wait until these for Scythia are all gone at just $21. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love show-off for Scythia love to shop. You're invited to Waters Garden Center's 56th Spring Open House. Last week's storm stalled the celebration, so we decided to keep on celebrating. We have even more spring plants to show off. New for 2018, drawings and more. Saturday's 930 class is titled Spring Trees and How to Grow Trees Better. All weekend, there's giveaways, access to local plant experts, and hot dogs on the grill. Join the fun at Waters' 56th Spring Open House all week long. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. Each week she comes with your garden questions. It's just good to hang out with fellow gardeners and just chat amongst ourselves and then listen in to what other people are asking, questioning. And that's what this segment's all about. Lisa brings those questions to us. Lisa, welcome to the studio. Thank you. Always good to be back. It is. Why? Because <laughs> it <laughs> gives me a chance to sit down. <laughs> yeah, it's been kind of crazy. Yeah, it has been busy. At the garden centers, are, yeah. are, are, we're going. So last weekend, we had our spring open house, 56 spring open house. Of course, it snowed <laughs> well. last weekend skip of snow out there and yeah. so but still people were engaged they were ready to go people are ready to garden they they truly are we had that warm weather early on that i think people started going oh and then it got cold and they went oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah you know those those people that truly love to garden to be out in the yard they, they're out no matter what Gar- the weather gardeners come no matter what the weather that yeah. seems to be the case they're here mm-hmm. you can tell who the gardeners are by the weather yeah. sometimes i'll greet people you know it's it's raining out or something. Go, you know, that's that's a sign you're a true gardener. Go, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's storming outside, and you you decide now's the time to go to the garden center. So we right. kind of we're kind of we go oh extra service because it's a true gardener. Make sure you help them out. And so last weekend, our our vendors we brought the growers, mm-hmm. the, the breeders. We actually got folks that patent plants. They look for new life. And uh, they were here all weekend. They're kind of nerdy plant people. <laughs> I'm going to tell them you said that. But don't, but they probably <laughs> they already know they're nerdy plant people. I mean, they're, they they hardly get out of the greenhouse, uh, and so they were amazed mm-hmm. that people were that busy. It was that busy with with that cold last weekend. Right. So so we wrote an ad and just said, you know what, spring open house continues. <laughs> <laughs> Through this weekend, just we'll just keep it going. Just cause, keep uh, it going. Yeah. It's hard to get those vendors to come back, the right. growers to come back, because they live life oh, yeah, out busy. on the farm, and yeah. they're just as busy or busier mm-hmm. than we are. They just did us a favor by by right. coming out. But, but this weekend, it's still hot dogs, and it's we're hanging out all weekend. We're talking mm-hmm. plants. We've got some new plants came in. Yes, and your uh, Easter baskets look they're beautiful. Oh, oh my goodness! So. Yeah. You, you should describe. So, oh. so Lisa puts these mixes together in, in hanging baskets weeks and weeks ago, and then uh, we, we f- flush them out. These are your petunias, calipracoas, pacopas, uh, the mixture of spring things. They'll mm-hmm. take some light frost, but not heavy. They won't take a freeze. It's best to, to have some color instantaneous, and we sell them for five, seven, ten dollars less. Just now through right. Easter, they're nineteen ninety nine. As soon as Easter 
is gone, it'll be you know twenty four ninety nine that right, kind of thing. Right. So it's yeah, beautiful bright color to put by your front door, especially if you're entertaining. You got Easter and those yeah. those things coming up. Uh, just a beautiful shot of color to put there. But you're right, you know, keep an eye on that weather. If we get those really hard frosts, which hopefully we're past, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you'd want to protect it a little bit, but easy to bring inside or to a garage, um, you know, if you need to protect them. But Just put them down the ground and against the house. Mm-hmm. That would probably, from here on, be enough, at least for the lower elevations, mm-hmm. you know, under 6,000 foot. You folks right. in Groom Creek and Williams and the higher Flagstaff, cause that's, that's a little colder, but that's, yeah. you know that. Right. It's this... this uh, Camp Verde, Cottonwood, Sedona, up to Prescott, mm-hmm. High, Highland Pines, and those areas under six thousand foot, you're fine. I think you're good to go. Mm-hmm. We actually take those baskets at our house, and we'll if we've got company over, and we will on Easter. We take them out. We take the hanger part off. We take them out of the basket. Mm-hmm. And this is cheating. Don't let any of our friends know. <laughs> uh, we we just plant that. Right in our pots. Right. And it looks like they've been growing there for like all winter and they were put in yesterday. But it's a, it's a designer thing that's got a mm-hmm. flare that is easy to, to oh, yeah. upgrade. Saves your... you a lot of time um, in just that aggravation of trying to put, you know, colors together. We've already yeah. done that for you and they, they are spectacular. So, And then uh, if, if it does get hard cold, we're not mm-hmm. going to move our big pots in. We just throw a sheet over them. That's yeah. good enough. That, that keeps them going. They're fine. Yeah, Give them flower power every couple of weeks. And wow, they just, by the end of the year growing season, the end of this year, 2000, like November, mm-hmm. the tendrils on the on the trailing petunias and calabrico, oh, yeah. they're, they're trailing down to the ground. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay, enough about our gardens. <laughs> Should we actually uh, talk about, get some questions in? Oh, At least sure. two or three of them. Okay, fine. Uh, Jan lives out in Paulden. She has room to put in several fruit trees. Question is, what's the difference between a semi-dwarf and a standard fruit tree yeah. size-wise? And then how much, how much space do you really need to give um, each tree? Okay, that's a good question. Those are common questions. Mm-hmm. And if you're doing the math on it, it's... it's, it's it's something you need to ask. And so we had our first house in Prescott Valley. Mm-hmm. This is back when Prescott Valley, this is, we're dating ourselves. They still had dirt roads. It wasn't called Jackass Flats anymore. It was <laughs> actually a town of Prescott Valley. We're not that old. But yeah. the, the roads were dirt and there were, you were on your own. You had septic fields mm-hmm. and, and, and you just had a, a power line going to your house. They've now changed all that and it's a magnificent town. So proud of mm-hmm. them. But back then, our backyard had chain link fence, standard six foot. And we put a tree, semi-dwarf tree, on every eight-foot center. And then in between the trees, we put grapes, blackberries, brambles. But we had a bunch of stuff out there, and mm-hmm. we packed it a little closer than normal. So eight-foot center is a little tight, but a semi-dwarf is about 30%, 25%, 30% smaller than a standard tree. A standard tree for, let's say, an apricot, about 25 feet, 20, 25. So a semi-dwarf is going to be... In the teens, mm-hmm. apples in the teens, cherries, apricots, nectarines, plums, all, all that about in the mid-teens. It's still a big tree, but it's a little smaller. It's a step down from a standard tree. For us, we actually pruned those back in the summer. They had elongate, put their summer growth on. We just keep that trimmed so they never got past uh, 10, 12, 15 feet. We just wouldn't let them grow any larger and it was a secret garden. It was beautiful, mm-hmm. lush, gorgeous, fruiting, ed- edible gardens. Even the dog run, mm-hmm. which was the side patio, uh, leaning up next to the garage, had the same design. And it was gorgeous. It was lush. And it was delicious. So you can do the same. So that's the difference. Spacing, oh, I would say every 15 feet or so is probably normal for a standard tree. If you let them go, you can definitely go smaller. We actually grow, let's see, what's a cherry? We have a peach tree currently right. in a big pot, mm-hmm. a fig in a big pot. You can grow them in a, in a, in a big, bigger pot. Mm-hmm. True genetic dwarf is going to be small. We're talking hip, chest high, tiny. Mm-hmm. They're genetically dwarfed. That's too small for most folks. Most folks want in their landscape a right. semi-dwarf or a standard. We've got both out, out in the garden center now. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we covered that one. 
Uh, next question is from Andy. This, there we go. More fruit trees. People are putting in fruit trees yeah, and guess, vines. Yeah. and all. I guess this is more raspberry blackberries. Wants to know, do you have to grow them on a trellis or a fence, or can they just be um, planted in the yard and free? Let them, let them be free. Let them be free. <laughs> uh, I would say blackberries, currants, gooseberries, blueberries can be free. Those are all upright, strong growers. The one that, well, the two, I guess, that really does need to climb up something if you're really going to get production are raspberries and grapes. Those two things need to climb up something, be tied to something, a trellis, a fence, something. Uh, Blackberries, we had ours tied up to a nice trellis to make it pretty. Mm -hmm. I like art and edibles. And uh, finally, blackberries, they just grow if they're happy. They just grow and they start supporting the structure they're on. They just have these big canes and they yeah. grow and they start to spread and come up in other beds. That's what a bramble does. Mm-hmm. Raspberry is a little less aggressive, but but appreciate. I think you get better production out of those. Now, with that being said, everything can be trained to go up something that keeps the fruit off of the ground. Mm-hmm. If they if they want to trail some, helps you just guide and train those things so they're easier to maintain right. and keep them back against a fence or back against a walkway. Helps you to maintain where they're at. Mm-hmm. So you can do either. Come in, to, take a picture for that space, bring it in. We could help guide you on spacing and how many and mm-hmm. what pergola or thing to put back there. But all of those, edibles, all of them can go in right now. You'll get production this year. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Now, on our Instagram page for Waters Garden Center, your Instagram, just type in Waters Garden Center, will pop up. Uh, I, I had a perfect example of flowering quince. It's this beautiful uh, orangey pink shrub about hip high that is Xerox scape. I, I would say native, drought hardy, commercial settings. I mean, put it next to asphalt, surround it by rock, expose it to wind, and this thing just blooms. Now, the quince that your parents or grandparents grew, this it actually put on a fruit, and they'd make quince jerry, uh, uh, jelly and jams and that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about that. This is an ornamental flowering quince. It's very pretty. Uh, this one they've dwarfed down, so it only gets hip high, whereas the regular quince gets lilac size, or even bigger, uh, you know, eight foot, 10 foot tall. Uh, it has a thorn, but we've bred that out of the regular ornamental one. So no thorn, don't have to prune on it, consistently blooms about the time the forsythia blooms. So you're seeing some yellow shrubs starting to bloom. Quince blooms about that time or a little bit sooner, but I posted this on Instagram to show you how to design with them. And these dwarf varieties, the shorter varieties, they need to be planted in clusters. You need to plant them in threes or fives. And generally in design terms, we say to plant things that are shorter in odd numbers and don't plant them in a row. You plant them in triangular patterns. And so it looks like 
God sprinkled seed down. They just naturally erupted from your yard. And they're so happy because their gardener that takes care of them is is such a green thumb. They just look at what happens. I just want to grow here. And that's the image you want to give. If they're in straight lines, they look more formal. They look like they've all, like they were planted and designed to do that. There's a place for that. You're going up to driveways and up to walkways. But I think they look more natural in triangular shapes. This is especially important in, uh, let's say, hillsides. Let's say you're trying to retain a hillside, but you can't really get, you need something tough. So you're putting a flowering quince out there. You want the beauty. You want the nice green shrub during the growing season. And you want that beautiful fall, uh, orangey, uh, 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 aspen gold kind of colors. And so you get three of the seasons there, and then it just goes dormant, deciduous. So that's how you get the drought hardiness on it. So there, don't plant in a straight row across the hill. Again, zigzag in triangular shapes. It looks more natural when you do that. And then I, I think we tend to sprinkle too much cottage garden stuff or New England style gardens. We just hip, haphazardly throw plants in there and, and we expect it all to grow and survival of the fittest. I think it looks more natural. I think it looks better designed when you commit to a type of plant, let's say it's a flowering quince or forsythia or dwarf lilacs, whatever it is, put them in triangular shapes, cluster them together, and you'll get more impact. If we were to sprinkle all of these things all together and just see which one grows, you'll get this smattering of pink through the yard, but not this glowing, pulsating gold of forsythia or quince or dwarf uh, bloomerang lilacs or whatever it is, I think more purposeful. And if you don't quite get that idea, that concept, please, please, for the sake of gardening, come in, take a picture, give us a quick measurement of what you're trying to do, and we will help you design it. I've designed literally hundreds, if not thousands of gardens in the walkways here here at the garden center. We just go, oh, I see it. I see what else is growing there. I can tell what companion plants go together there. So I'll go, oh, what would also look good with that is, look, these three things. We just start spacing it out. Now, you can capture a picture. You can wrap your brain around that and go, oh, yeah, I can do this. This is, this is so much better. I design uh, containers, to container gardens. You give me a measurement on your container garden, just on the top shelf of a shopping cart, that's about the right size for even resort size pots. We'll just go here, put these plants together, put this in the middle, this towards the back, have them, have them where the foliage is just touching. When you get home, put them together just like this. And all of a sudden it gets very easy to design gardens. So if we just need a measurement, because you can't tell how far something is on a picture, an iPad, iPhone or, or pad, but you can get a picture of the, the shadowing, the the sunlight to companion plant. So take a picture, quick measurement. We can help you design gardens so they just scream style in your backyard. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Growing up in Prescott, we knew spring was here when my grandmother's lilacs bloomed. I'm Lisa Waters Lane, and my grandma would be thrilled with the new Bloomerang Pink Perfume Lilacs at Waters Garden Center. New pink blooms fill the landscape with fragrance of grandma over and over again in the garden. Mine bloomed three times last year, making spring last well into fall, all for under $25. Lilacs like grandma used to grow, and better. Waters Garden Center. 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. And in the studio, we've got Lisa Watersling. She comes each week, just shares her garden skill, expertise, beauty, fragrance, design. Uh, how do you get a prettier, nicer uh, garden where you just want to spend some time, watch a sunset, sip some coffee, uh, just to come in and, and watch the hummingbirds and the butterflies float by. Uh, we're big bird gardeners, attracting more birds. Lisa does that really well. And so when you go by her house, which I happen to be the privilege of living with her in that house, 
It's stunning. You 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 drive by and go, wow, that's pretty nice. Like they might own a garden center, and they do. So it's just kind of that look. What we want to glean her brain, get this information out, so that uh, we can all share in this beauty in our own backyard. Lisa, they set the stage well enough. <laughs> Now, meet that expectation. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can't. <laughs> You're a god, goddess in my world. So. I was like, oh, don't know what to say. <laughs> anyway, whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Just We're all interested. Oh, wonderful. So this week I thought I would talk about, um, I've had a lot, you can tell always when there's, there's new building going on, you get people in. Um, you know, with their yards or they're trying to block their neighbor's yard. Yeah. So um, hedges and screens, um, I've answered a lot of questions about those um, this past couple of weeks. So I thought we'd kind of chat about that. So um, a lot of people want hedges either to, you know, they're putting them in to define part of their yard, like near a patio. Um, so they're using it to define that area. Other people are doing screens where they're trying to block either something they don't want to see, their neighbor's house, or sometimes they're blocking something at their own house that the neighbors have already complained about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you kind of get both on there. Um, we have we put up a screen of uh, Spartan junipers n- trying to s- kind of make a f- secret garden out of our front yard, which is you know faces the street, but we had a beautiful patio put in. And we just kind of wanted to soften that so people, when they walked by or drove by, couldn't just look right down into our yard. Um, so we did that with Spartan Junipers. So there's um, there's different purposes for what people are looking for. Um, and the thing that I always ask people is, what what height are you going for? You know, do you want a little three foot hedge just to define your uh, perennial area, or are you looking for a twenty foot tree to block the neighbor's RV garage. So the first thing you always want to think about is what height am I looking for? Because if you only want a four foot hedge, um, I wouldn't recommend putting a foot in there. <laughs> 15 foot beast to <laughs> right. be cutting on it every other week. You'll be constantly pruning on it. If, it, if it's a you know, going in front of your front windows, you don't want something that's going to grow up and that you're going to have to be constantly cutting back to look through the windows. Or maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. So think about the height that you want it to be because that is it's going to define what type of plant you can put in there. Um, you know, we certainly have many examples of things that can get three to four foot tall, things that get four to five foot tall. Then you got your fotinias and things that get six to eight to 12 foot tall. And then you get into the real big guys. So um, you just got to think about your space first. And the other thing is, what kind of light is that space getting? Um, A lot of people don't think too much about the sun. And they're not really tracking how much sun or how much shade a spot is getting. Because there are some plants that you could put into a real shady spot that you couldn't put into a full sun spot. So it's it's good to track that summer sun is what we're more interested in, correct? Yeah, the growing season is what really matters. Mm-hmm. The winter, it's just dark. It's just it's just you're inside. Who cares? So right. your plants go to sleep and it doesn't matter. But the sun, and I find that my California folks, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Tucson, these folks, they're coming from areas where they've had gardeners. They've been working mm-hmm. like for, for a long time. They've retired. They've moved here. And it's the retired folks that are coming that have had gardeners over there. And now they're going to try to do it themselves here. And they're going, they didn't care <laughs> there. They had people that would take yeah. care of it. But you don't want to put a a 50-foot Deodor cedar next to your house. And you're going to try to maintain it. Right. A Fotinia next to the driveway. And you're going to try to maintain it. Don't bother yourself. If you're trying to do it yourself or, or reduce the cost or the expense or just mm-hmm. the time you like to travel instead of maintain the yard, go with Ellie Agnes or for privets or some of these mm-hmm. lesser growing, uh, slower growing uh, dwarf type of, of evergreens instead of these huge, fast growing. I want it instant. I want it growing. I want it to be fully mature by the end of this year. We can do that, but it's going to cost you in time and Mm -hmm. pruning and maintenance and gardening fees down the road. Right. Uh, Maybe it'd be better to take a longer term view Mm -hmm. of that, of that landscape plan. 
Yeah. The other thing to think about is, if, especially if you're doing hedges, is this, are you the type of person that likes perfect squares, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, true. or are you more of a freeform gardener? You like that natural look out in your yard. So there's some that um, l- lend themselves perfectly to being hedged. You know, some of the cotoneasters, junipers, um, the photinias, things like that. They don't mind if you're cutting them all the time to keep them in nice little squares or shapes. Um, and then there's others that are going to look so much prettier if you just let them kind of have that natural look to them. Um, I always think of the Cotoneaster parnii, the red clusterberry parnii. It is such a beautiful shaped um, shrub. It gets about six by six, and it has kind of a, a fountain or vase shape to it. It is so pretty if you just let it go natural. Um, but so many people put that in, and they're shaping it, which I guess if you want, you can. We call that seussing, like <laughs> Dr. Seuss. <laughs> just No, just... You can tell who they are. Yeah. Engineers, you know who you are. Nurses, right. computer engineer, computer designer. You you know accountants. Yeah. You know, perfect must stay in the box. Yeah. So. And if you like that look, look for a boxwood. Yeah, you know the, the Nandina. Nandina, it's a great is, choice right. for that. They, Low they maintenance, stay their shape. But if you like that natural look, look for things that are going to look pretty if you just let them grow and not get rangy and out of control. Um, so if you're looking for things that are, are taller, so say you want something in the 12 to 15 foot range, um, I always, there's two junipers that I like for that. And that is the Spartan Juniper in the Wichita Blue. And I love those because they get 12 to 15, so they're not going to get huge out of control. Um, but they grow pretty fast into that their size that you want them to be. And so easy to take care of. Yeah. Uh, if you want, if you don't want to be out there every single weekend trying to maintain them, those would be perfect. We use Spartans in our front yard because we wanted mm-hmm. the green. Right. We've got quite a bit of blue. We had a lot of natural colors. We wanted a, something contrasting. So green worked for us, mm-hmm. Spartan in the front. And we've not done anything. No. I mean, we had spider mites on them one year, but no, that was it. No trimming. Mm-hmm. We fertilize regularly because we're trying to push them up to size right. so that we get that screened effect. But talk about low maintenance, methodical growth, just consistent, easy mm-hmm. to grow. And we've done Wichita Blue before in the past. Maybe right. that's why we went Spartan. Well, we've done the blue one. <laughs> Let's do the green one. And we kind of get bored with plants and we want to yeah. have fun with it. So we we use the same way mm-hmm. the Wichitas. Yeah, certainly take the sun and the abuse, the wind. Yeah. Um, they hold up really, really well. The other one that a lot of people like to use is the emerald arborvitae. Oh, good call. Yep. Yeah. And and that has a little bit different look. It, it's very attractive. Um, and maybe you have a different opinion, but that hot wind and sunspot, um, I don't know. I've seen them struggle a little bit there, but what do you think? I think the ridge lines with a rock shelf. They're not so good. They need some soil. Mm-hmm. But for the mid coast, uh, Midwest and East Coast folks, they love our arborvita. There's some spectacular specimens, just gorgeous. Mm-hmm. But they're usually not on the windswept caps uh, with, with the views. They're down, right. highlighting the patios, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But thick, dark green that grows tall, not wide but doesn't grow as tall as an Italian cypress or some of these True. other monsters. Mm-hmm. Italian cypress is 50, I think it goes to the moon, and only three feet wide. Right. This one only goes just above head high, mm-hmm. I mean, 10 feet tall and, and three foot wide. Right. It's a good choice for that. Evergreen plants that help you screen. Elisa's got a bunch of them out there. I love your privacy screen area you guys mm-hmm. just created. Yeah. It's, it's lots of choices in there. Here, we curated them all. They're all right here. Look, look right here. And so it makes it easy to, to show sure. people which ones are best. Lisa, Waters Lane and Privacy Screens. Be right back on The Mountain Gardeners. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Waters here with this week's Plant of the Week and our show-off for Scythias. A new standout for Scythia with very large, very bright solar yellow flowers that adorn the plant from head to toe. Relax! This showy spring shrub is beautiful and requires no pruning or cleanup. 
this show off is just days away from bloom and limited. So don't wait until these forsythia are all gone at just $21. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love show off forsythia love to shop. And we are in the studio. Oh, I've got a special segment for you folks. I've got a expert that knows how to kill things, basically. He's uh, <laughs> Gary St- Stermandinoli. Did I get that right? You got it right. Oh, l l Nursery. Uh, he is the largest. He represents the largest supplier of basically fertilizers, buckillers, uh, uh, potting soils, Garden gift. I mean, you guys are just a behemoth when it comes to gardening supply stuff. How many states are you guys in? L and L Nursery Supply. How, how big? Oh, we cover everything from California coast over to Texas. Oh, really? We go straight up to Wyoming. Uh, we do Alaska. Okay. Oh, and, you know, Western Alaska, and then we also do Hawaii. So how you're you're barging or shipping that stuff up, and then have a yes. warehouse up there or something? No, no, it goes straight into the nurseries. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. No holding yard. Now you're you are responsible. You're the guy for all of Arizona. Arizona. Uh, how, no, what's your I'm, territory? I'm kind of back. I'm just northern Arizona now. Okay. If you draw a line from Lake Havasu over to Pine Top Lakeside and okay. then north, that's my territory. So I, I was Gary was in in the eye. I was teaching our staff. On, on scale, pine scale, and then how to best effectively, how to keep pines healthy. That was it. And so he's one of our trainers, and you really don't deal with consumers. Correct. You're deal, you're, your main focus is the garden centers and then making them as smart as possible so that they can represent, uh, make sure the consumer uses it correctly. And so That's you right. are training our staff Opinion Pines, I'd love to go deeper with that. If you don't mind sharing or, or getting it down to consumer level or listener level, how sure. if someone's got Opinion Pine or just pine trees in general, because flathead borers, uh, bark beetles, uh, tip borers on cypress, they get into evergreen. So we have evergreen forests here. So the bugs seem to be specialized in, in eating evergreens. And so you were training us on that. Pinion pines, let's start with that and see where it goes. Yeah, the pinion pines, uh, what you want to look for is any residue on the needles or down towards the, the branch itself. Okay. Look closely at it, see if there's any reddish or uh, you'll be able to tell, you know, if there's a scale on there. Scale's difficult to kill with an insecticide, so you basically have to smother it. Okay. So what you want to use is a summer oil or a horticultural oil. Uh, spray the trees. Uh, generally, you see it, it starts out in the springtime uh, as the weather warms. And spray the scale down or spray the tree down with a horticultural spray. And it smothers um, that scale that's on the branches. And that's the best way to control it. And it's environmentally, you know, um, environmentally friendly, I guess you'd say. Yeah, it's organic, I'm yeah, sure. It, it's, 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 a, it's a natural product. Put oil on your skin. Yeah, it's not a poison. The, yeah. Yeah. So uh, poisons don't affect it because it builds up this coating over the scale itself and the insecticides can't penetrate it. So it slips right off or, or right. it doesn't? So the, so the oil coats that, that outer shell of the scale and smothers the insect that's within that shell. So now, scale has a crawler stage. So they've, they've had spring. They've, they've laid their eggs. Now, then they hatch. And they crawl up, they call it the crawler right. stage, up the branch, up the trunk, and they reattach themselves to the new needle growth. Right. And so on the needle, you'll see this little black dot, or it looks, you can't yeah, see little, it's an insect. It looks like, a, yeah. like someone took a Sharpie and just kind of put a, right. to put a number two pencil on, on each, of the, each of the needles. It actually pierces that needle and sucks the juice out of it till it dies, till it shrivels yeah, and dies. Yeah, you see a yellowing and then a browning of that needle. Gotcha. That's um, an indication of scale. Right. So if once it attaches itself, it's no, it'll put a, a hard surface over the body of that to keep ladybugs and praying mantis and things off of that, that insect. But it's still alive underneath that scale. Right. And you're saying if we coat to that with an oil, it'll suffocate that insect. Correct. Yeah. That's good to know. I, didn't, I, I knew the crawler stage. It would kill that, but then anything will kill a crawler. An insect, it's, it's got a soft body, and so they just attack a tree by the thousands of insects. So every single needle will be infected 
with the scale. So I've always said use the systemic drench. So use the plant protector at the base to taint the soil. So when they attach that needle, when they pierce that that needle, it'll suck the juice that's been tainted with a plant protector. Uh, One application lasts a year, but you're saying, could could I take care of all of it with just a spray of an oil? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, The plant protector is great, um, but basically it's most effective when the tree is actively growing. Correct, yeah. So during the wintertime, it's not going to do anything. And and they're not that active in the winter. They're more active as the weather warms up. This year we're seeing it earlier than usual. Oh, yeah. But they can affect it all year long, you know, especially in the warmer weather. Well, we had such a mild winter this year that – I don't think the scale ever stopped sucking the juice out of that, I don't that think so. tree. The tree didn't, the sap didn't slow down. You know, usually if you go down to single digits, zero, sub zero, everything locks into place. It just stops flowing. And so the insect stops eating and almost hibernates. Well, they just kept going this year. Yeah. And we're seeing more damage to the pine trees than ever, um, than ever, basically. So now what about the height of a tree? So if I can't get that spray that high, let's say it's a 30-foot pinion pine. A hose and sprayer will take you a certain certain angle. you got to spray it from a couple angles to kind of get the whole needle growth. It's hard to spray a big pinion pine. Would that, could you use plant protector and the oils in conjunction to kind of sure. thin the numbers with the oil? And then the more permanent fix for the entire structure would be the plant protector. Yeah, the What's plant your thought protector, on that? Put it around the base. Make sure you get it out to the root, you okay. know, out, out to the perimeter of the tree, the drip line of the tree, because that's where the roots are taking up that, yeah. that insecticide. Okay. Uh, the other way to do it is with an ace cap. Oh, that's a good you're, thought. You're actually implanting it into the tree itself. Yeah. So that if you have plastic down or some rocks or something where you can't get to that root system with the insecticide, the ace cap is a is a material that you drill as a capsule with the insecticide in it. You drill into the trunk of the tree, um, implant it below the cambium, and the tree will actually grow over that implant. Yeah, yeah. And it does the same thing. It, as a tree is taking its sap up into the, the foliage, uh, it draws up that uh, orthene is what's in that ace cap. Oh, I so didn't know that. So it'll do the same thing. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's good. Now, I also noticed I had... Uh, I had scale on my ceanothus, my native evergreen shrub. It's grown in my backyard. It grows with the the, uh, oaks, the Mm -hmm. scrub oaks, Mm -hmm. ceanothus. It's a great little plant. I trim it back. It's cute as can be. Scale got on that last year, a huge scale. It had to be five times the size of a pinion pine scale. Gnarly looking thing. I I caught it because some of the branches were dying off. I'm going, what the heck is going on? I take a close look. And scales all over it. I sprayed it with permethrin, which is kind of this harsh chemical. And I'd rather not spray that if I don't have to. I'd rather keep it organic if I could, but I was so desperate. You're saying the oil would probably also work even on the larger scale. Just put it off? Yes, exactly. I'm going to remember that. That's valuable to know. Nothing safer or less expensive. It's very inexpensive, and it's an oil. So it's a natural product. Uh, it's not harmful to, you know, birds and other animals, even other insects. Okay. So it works really well. Horticultural grade oil. Yes. And you guys provide it. We, we have it yes. here at the nursery. Mm-hmm. We like that one because it's a, it's a higher grade. It's a better quality. It's very good quality. Uh, and so you can spray it even when the temperatures creep up into the 80s, maybe up to yeah, 90 or so, 85, 90. It's got a on as anything over 90. Okay. But I've seen it work. Even above that temperature, but really? ninety is what the limitation is. Gotcha. The the lower end of that limitation is forty degrees. Okay. So anything between forty and ninety, it's effective. And most days in the mountains of Arizona, could I do this? In the winter, it's going to be above forty in the mountains. I could spray it during the day, and it sure. would knock it down. Then at night, it'll freeze. But in the summer, it's not. It's maybe ninety five. But I could spray towards the evening, so spray it's going to be below. Really night. early in the morning, so yeah, it has a chance good idea. To yeah. So the mountains, we could use that easily year round. Sure, that is, I learned something. 
Yeah. That is valuable. That's that's. Thank you for sharing that. And now I can keep my yard even more organic with horticultural grade oil. Yes. Sold here at Waters Garden Center. Thanks so much, Gary, mm-hmm. uh, with LNL Nursery Supply. Be right back with more garden tips, tricks, and techniques on the Mountain Gardener. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is well pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and orderless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. You know, just talking about that screening plant, quickly uh, the mathematics behind placement of plants. If you want to know how many you're going to need, you take... On the tag, it says it grows 10 feet tall, 6 foot wide. You take the width, and then you divide it by half, and that will be your spacing for that plant, assuming you're going to plant the same thing all the way through. So you're going to take a privet, 8 by by 6. You divide it, that width by half, so 8 by 6, 3 foot. Put them on 3 foot centers. That privet hedge will grow so thick and so lush and all the way up the entire width or height of that plant where you have a solid wall. If you cut back on that, it will take longer for it to fill in or those dimensions on most of your plants, the height, it won't be that that wide at the very tip of that plant. It'll be wide at the base. So if it says eight by six, it's six foot wide at, at, at the ground, not the very top. So you need to compensate for that. So you get this overlapping pattern. Hopefully I described that well enough. That's kind of hard to describe over the airwaves. But just if you're, if, again, my name's Ken. We're just neighbors talking over the fence. And this is how I've done a lot of, of hedge rows for privacy, especially. But hedges that you want to overlap and trim and just be thick. I'll take the tag, and I, I don't really know before I talk to you. I'm, I'm going, let's read this tag together. I'm doing the math. I know we got to do 15 feet. I'm going, oh, six. So we got, it uh, says six foot wide. Uh, you want three foot centers? You're going to need five of those. And I'll just quickly help you pick five that match. So that's a real quick way to decide how many you need. Arizona cypress. That's a a 20 by 12 foot wide, huge evergreen, natural evergreen. There I'd go 12 foot. Oh, I'm trying to screen out the um, uh, headlights coming into my house from a T-shaped intersection in my neighborhood or reduce dust on a dirt road or noise going down a major intersection, I want to use a big, thick evergreen. I'll go, oh, 12 foot, divide by half, put it six foot centers. I'm doing a whole, you know, the entire front yard, 60 feet. I'll put them at six foot centers. You're going to need nine or 10 of these. And I'll help you pick nine or 10 that are consistent. And that's a quick way to, to really up your game on space. And you can do that math yourself. Easy. Once you know what to look for. Uh, an invite. This weekend, we're doing trees. It's time to plant trees. Oh, it's so the perfect timing. The trees are starting to wake up. They're starting to look good. It's a good time to plant trees at that point. So we're going over what are the best trees and and how to plant them. That'll be this weekend. Next week's class is really exciting because Lisa is going to teach that and, and, and probably Cheryl and some others. It's advanced container gardens. So we have over 50 pots, containers in our yard and a lot of raised beds. Lisa puts those together. She's going to go over how to combine, what to look for, how to make it look lush. And she's going to bring out her floral designs. uh, It's kind of like a a florist. You design sort of like that, only they all grow in together. And then the week after that, April 7, this is a big one. It's drip irrigation design and install. I'm going to teach this one myself. I've installed literally thousands and thousands of feet of, of irrigation pipe over the decades. I'm going to share my insight which emitter heads to use, how to space them, how many emitters can you get off that. How do you have just a quickie emitter coming off the hose bib that you can use for a back patio and then travel? We're we're going to go deep, deep into drip irrigation design. Come early for that one. It will be packed, I'm telling you. 
So we have classes at 930. And so we'll have every seat we have, then it will still be standing room only for that one. And so just, just be aware, bring your own chair. That could be an advantage as well. So you could look at those classes at watersgardencenter.com. The very front page, it'll have a big class button. Just hit that and it'll pop right up. Also Facebook, it's under Waters Garden Center. And then the events tab, you'll see all the classes right there. They're free every Saturday at 930. And of course, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center throughout the week. You come in and visit, mention you heard the show and how much you enjoyed it. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. You're invited to Waters Garden Center's 56th Spring Open House. Last week's storm stalled the celebration, so we decided to keep on celebrating. We have even more spring plants to show off. New for 2018, drawings and more. Saturday's 930 class is titled Spring Trees and How to Grow Trees Better. All weekend, there's giveaways, access to local plant experts, and hot dogs on the grill. Join the fun at Waters' 56th Spring Open House all week long. Ouch! Oh man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. We got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.